Welcome to A Look Ahead. As you may know, we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a series covering the first three months of 2013. This is lesson number nine in that series, and our friends around the world will be studying on our March 2 of 2013. Before we start, however, we would like to have you get out your Bible and be ready to look at some passages with us. This is a very, um, some would call it a controversial subject. Marriage, a gift from heaven. So get ready. Here we go. Let's pray to have the Holy Spirit's guidance. Our kind and loving Father, you know that human relationships are one of your specialties. You intended for us to learn how to love each other just as you and the Father and the Holy Spirit love each other. But we have a hard time behaving like gods. We have a hard time even behaving like humans should behave. And then there's the question of marriage. And we know how much the devil has done to try to destroy marriage in our day. Now guide us as we, we look at some of the passages in Scripture and talk about what you intended for us. May it uh, inspire us to do better is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> so as we suggested, this lesson will focus on relationships. We will specifically focus on that very special relationship called marriage. When God wanted to create a million angels or even a billion angels, what did he do? Created he, spoke. he created one by one a billion angels. Maybe, maybe he created them in mass. I don't know how he did it, but each one had to be designed and created himself individually. But when he wanted a million or a billion human beings, he just made two. Why do you suppose he did that difference? Why is that plan so much different for us? Oh, I think that was so that <clears throat> some of his creation could understand some of the trials and tribulations and pain that he has <laughs> undergone dealing with his people. Well, Ellen White says in Review and Herald, February 11, 1902, and it's also found in Volume 1 of the Bible Commentary, page 1081, human beings were a new and distinct order of beings. And she goes on to describe how we have the capacity to reproduce and so forth. God intended for us to have children out of a loving marriage relationship. The process of giving birth to those children and I'm not just talking about the physical process of giving birth, but the whole process of raising those children and caring for them and training them to be responsible adults is a very important lesson for us in our understanding of God's challenges and dealing with us as His children, as you suggested, Norm. Well, a happy marriage and a loving home are an incredible blessing. Statistics show that less than 10% of the population in the United States have reached such a high ideal. Divorces have gone past the 50% level. Thus marriage leads mostly to pain and anger rather than joy and peace. That was certainly not God's original intention. I'm sure it wasn't what Adam and Eve experienced in those wonderful early days in the Garden of Eden. Well, look at these words from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46. God celebrated the first marriage. Thus, the institution has for its originator the creator of the universe. Marriage is honorable, it says in Hebrews 13, 4. It was one of the first gifts of God to man. And it is one of the two institutions that, after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. And what's the other one? Sabbath. The Sabbath. When the divine principles are recognized and obeyed in this relation, marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race. It provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. So that's what's supposed to happen. So what does happen? Well, when God created our world step by step, he pronounced each step very good. I um, start, each step good. At the end, he said it was all very good. But after creating Adam, there was something that was not good. And what was that? He was alone. 
Well, look at Genesis 2, 7. <coughs> then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils, and the man began to live. So now we have the man. We come down to verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to live alone. I will make a suitable companion for him. A suitable companion for him. For him. That means somebody to argue with him or someone to disagree with him or what did he intend? Someone to do everything he said. <laughs> I see. Yeah, now that we have yeah. no ladies here at this one, we can get away with that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> well, it's interesting to notice that everything, every creature was made from the soil of the ground except Eve. Why was she different? Well, when God recognized his great need because he was alone, because uh, God put him into a deep sleep, as we know, Genesis 2, 21, took a rib from his side, and did he ever miss that rib? And formed Eve out of that rib. <clears throat> well, we, we can learn several lessons, potentially, from uh, that passage. Let's just look at that passage, Genesis 2, 18 to 25. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to live alone. I will make a suitable companion to help him. So, I, so he took some soil from the ground, formed all the animals and all the birds. Then he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And that is how they all got their names. But not only that, what else happened? Adam noticed what? Hey, there's something wrong here. <laughs> so the man named all the birds and all the animals, but not one of them was a suitable companion to help him. Then the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the, fre the flesh. If everything was very good after all of this, whatever on earth did Adam need for help? I mean, if he was you, you, you perfect in like, everything. Yeah. And you sound like the guy who said God made the earth and he rested, and God made Adam and he rested, and then God made Eve, and since then nobody's rested. <laughs> Well, God made this woman out of his rib and brought her to him. Then the man said, and he burst out with poetry, At last, here is one of my own kind, bone taken from my bone, flesh from my flesh. How did he know that? Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. Do you think he had a pain in his side where the rib was missing? Well, he might have had a missing rib, but his children didn't. No. <laughs> No. But he might have. I, I don't know whether yeah. God replaced his rib or not. <laughs> he had a video of the surgery. I there see. you go. Okay. Well, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one. The man and the woman were both naked, but they were not embarrassed. So that's a story about how it all got started. By the way, the whole universe was watching. And they had never seen creatures like this before. The Godhead the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work in perfect unity and harmony. And they have done so throughout eternity. God is love, and love can only be expressed in relationships. Did God ask Adam to name the animal so that he would recognize more deeply than he had before the need for a companion? I think so. When he woke up and saw Eve, Adam's response indicates how excited he was about having a companion. Before she was created, Adam can only talk to whom? God. God, God himself. and the angels. But there was no one like himself. So are, are we saying that this, that, that hum, humans are a unique and distinct species, not just on this planet, but in the universe? Ellen White seems to imply that. And that... Um, <coughs> that um, we 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 have a we have a need for a companion, and that other creatures do not have other beings on other planets do not necessarily have a need for a companion. Well, do we have any evidence that the angels needed compa need companions? Well, the companionship of God, certainly, but um, that, that doesn't... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, it, it well, I don't know. I, I think they have the companionship of one another. Yeah. 
Well, it's interesting to note that when Adam apparently named all the animals, which presumably included some great apes, he did not find any creature that was like himself. Now, our evolutionist friends would like to suggest that great apes are almost humans, right? Certainly that far back. Maybe not now, but that far back, we just barely came out of those great apes, didn't we? Well, this is a very stark, a stark contrast, we might say, to the evolutionary ideas. Adam didn't think any of those great apes was fine enough <laughs> for him. And I suppose if he had tried to take some female great ape, the male great ape might have had a few things to say about it. <laughs> well, why do you suppose God chose to create Eve from a rib of Adam? We've suggested that, and we all know the story. There's a story said that uh, God created man and said, I can do better. So he created a woman. So a, that, a rib a, is better to start with than, than some soil? Well, the symbolism of taking something from Adam's side rather than from above him or beneath him mm -hmm. or from the soil. Or, or well, if it's not supposed to be part of him. Yeah. I mean, this is the, I mean, to take something out of him and make something beautiful. I mean, that's part of me over there. I mean, let's, let's, let's enjoy that. Yeah. If God had made Adam out of soil over here and Eve out of soil over there and then brought them together, you might say, well, maybe God didn't make them completely compatible. But Adam and Eve, if he was taken, made out of Adam, um, by the way, I... I like what one midwife said to me. Uh, Eve may have been taken out of Adam, but every man since then has been taken out of woman. That's right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> these were not two separate individuals that God somehow brings together. They were one from in the very essence of their being. Um, it, were they supposed to... Uh, exemplify some characteristics of God to the universe? Yes. I think so. So, we see that they were made male and female, mm -hmm. so we would have to look for both feminine characteristics and male characteristics in God? Mm -hmm. Yes. I wonder, did you suppose the angels felt a little jealous? One did. One third that followed the one. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly can't say that God didn't provide for Adam. Here's this gorgeous garden, all the food he could possibly want, animals around to, to associate with and have fun with, and then he comes up with this beautiful woman that he's married to. Um, God, Adam certainly didn't have any excuse for not remaining faithful. So what, he, what should he have said to Eve when she sinned? Ah, God can do a better job. Let's go see what he has to say. Well, I'd like to take that argument back a couple of steps before that happened and say, just think how different things would have been if Eve had said, you know, this tree has been here as long as I can remember. It's still going to be here tomorrow. Let me go talk to Adam about this fruit. I'll talk to God about this fruit. If it's a good idea to eat of it, it'll be here tomorrow. Well, where would we be if Eve had taken that approach? Of course, we know what happened. Eve sinned, and Adam couldn't bear the thought of being separated from her, so he had some of the fruit, too. Um, was that Could God idea? have done a better job? Yeah, maybe it would have been better if he'd have made it out of <coughs> made it out of soil from some other place in the garden instead of Adam's rib. Then Adam wouldn't have been so attached, and we wouldn't be in this mess. I don't know. I <coughs> I know a lot. Of, pretty you know, bad. <laughs> I know a lot of guys who feel pretty attached. <sighs> and they weren't independently created out of soil. <laughs> That's right. Well, when sin entered our world, as you know, everything that God intended for us was spoiled in one way or another. Careful students of the Bible recognize that the two institutions which we still have as blessings from God extending from the Garden of Eden are the Seventh-day Sabbath and marriage. 
what a wonderful thing it would be if all or at least or at least Christians could have marriages as God originally intended. Wouldn't the world flock to our doors to find out what was our secret to have a wonderful, perfect marriage? Yeah. Well, by contrast, author William Faulkner once called marriage a failure and wrote that, and I quote, the only way to get any peace out of it is to keep the first one, the first wife, and stay as far away from here as much as you can with the hope of someday outliving her. Pretty sick. What does this say about the current state of a marriage? <clears throat> well, in Jesus' day, he repeated the instructions given to, by God to Moses in Genesis. Uh, you remember Mark 10, 5 to 12, and comparing. Let's just look at that. Look at Mark 10. We'll, we'll look at Jesus' version of things. Mark 10, starting with verse 5. Jesus said to them, Moses wrote this law for you because you're so hard to teach. But in the beginning, at the time of creation, God made them male and female, as the scripture says. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one. So they are no longer two, but one. No human being then must separate what God has joined together. When they went back into the house, the disciples asked Jesus about this matter. He said to them, a man divorces his wife and marries another woman, commits, a man who does that, commits adultery against his wife. In the same way, a woman who divorces her husband and marries another man commits adultery. So he was pretty blunt about that stuff, wasn't he? And adultery wasn't looked on with much favor at that point. No, it wasn't. <laughs> That's, I mean, now, I mean, that's hardly given a thought, the <laughs> fact that in today's world, if she, if she divorces, she commits adultery, so what? Yeah. But that wasn't the attitude then. Not my then. problem, right? Yeah, right. That was, but that wasn't the attitude then. No. Oh, I think that's been a problem in all generations. Selfishness has been. Why do you think it specifically mentions that a husband should leave his father and mother, but it says nothing about the wife leaving hers? Because at the time, every woman left her family to get married. That was the standard. That was the regular thing that happened. <clears throat> Usually the, father, the woman would go and move in with the husband's family, and he would often... And if you look at, if you look at the patterns among Greeks and Romans, especially Romans in the days of Jesus, so long as that elder male is alive in the family, he has almost absolute jurisdiction over even his married children and their grandchildren and everybody. He, he was like a demigod. God says nothing to it. Every family needs to be given their own opportunity to set up their own relationship and, and, and in cooperation with God to establish their own home. So we say a marriage needs to be between one man and one woman, and they need to learn how to manage their affairs together. They do not need the helpful or harmful influence of in-laws or parents. Leaving our parents would certainly suggest that the new couple should be financially independent and be expected to make their own mutual marriage decisions. Just a few couple of hours ago, I was seeing a young man who has two lovely children, uh, he's got a serious disease that's plaguing his life. His wife left him for that reason and left the children too. So now he's got to care for these kids in addition to his disease. He's, because of his disease, he's lost his job and now he's got to move back in with his parents' house, into his parents' house. And every time he manages to get a little money, the parent says, oh, you owe us that money for taking care of you here. How's he supposed to get ahead? How's he supposed to do anything? Well, look at those words that, the, that God used to describe marriage back in the beginning. We know about the leaving. We've been talking about that. What about the cleaving? What does that mean, the cleaving? Everybody's well, it's the opposite of the leaving. Opposite of the <laughs> leaving, okay. It suggests that the husband and wife should talk together. They should develop a very close communication and thus establish a growing love relationship. The new couple needs to develop a unity. They need to work on cooperating together to build a relationship like the relationships in heaven. And finally, they need to wait 
to enter into the marriage relationship until they're prepared to make a lifetime commitment. Someone has said that cleaving means this relationship must be as close as the skin is to the body. That's pretty close. Pretty close. Finally, in the original words of Genesis, young men are told to become one flesh with their wives in the marriage relationship. We know about that. Becoming one flesh suggests that the culmination of this relationship should be a pure sexual union. In the polytheistic and pagan societies surrounding Palestine, even in Jesus' day, sexual promiscuity was rampant. Do you think that that had anything to do with Jesus' repetition, repetition of the instructions from Genesis? Everybody's afraid to say anything, huh? <laughs> well, yes isn't a very long answer. <laughs> yes isn't a very long answer, okay. <laughs> Well, as you suggested earlier, and let, let's spell this out a little bit, some of the characteristics of God are more embodied by the natural tendencies of women. And some of the characteristics of God are more embodied in the natural characteristics of men. It is Such God as? You're talking about the male characteristics? Well, yeah, even both. both. The male and okay. the female. Okay. Well, uh, and... We'll go on and talk a little bit more about this later, perhaps, but women are naturally more caring. They're more caring, for, particularly of children, for example, than men are. Men are more assertive. They're more willing to step out and take chances. They're willing to try things new. Uh, just Those are just a few examples of many that could be given. Well, those may be patterns, but in some cases... <clears throat> that isn't manifested. There are women who are more, even in some marriages, there are women who are willing to take more risks. Yes. Whereas uh, uh, the male may be more caring toward the children, even though the wife may have. So we're playing percentages here. <clears throat> well, I'm not sure how to. Somehow there's an argument for that, but I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> Paul was the apostle who talked the most about marriage. You know the famous words, Ephesians 5 especially. Let's, let's look at those. Now, the, the part that's incredible here, now my Bible, fortunately, there's a nice big divider uh, just before verse 21 of Ephesians 5, but usually we don't read verse 21. In fact, if you look at your quarterly, it starts with verse 22. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed because verse 21 says, submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Then we usually start off reading, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now why do we want to read that part? For a husband has authority over his wife just as Christ has authority over the church and Christ is himself the savior of the church, his body. And so wives must submit completely to their husbands just as the church submits itself to Christ. What does that mean? Wives, you must submit yourself completely to your husbands. It's only if he's got it put together <laughs> with God. Okay. Well, when the general conference says something or the preacher says something, why, that's what you do. When it the is. Pope sends an encyclical or yeah. whatever those <laughs> things are he sends, why... That's the way it's supposed to be. You do that and don't ask questions. I see. <clears throat> we could even start a couple of uh, verses back further from verse 19. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll even go back just to touch into 18. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then we go into wives submit. And then as we dig in here, we'll find out that there's a kind of an equal amount of submission happening. Mm -hmm. People, they get really uptight and, and uh, about that one verse, verse 22. But we'll see there's a balance in there. 
Mm -hmm. Husbands are also but submitting, laying down I their think, lives, I think that cherishing, verse, honoring. That verse 21 is referring to that which is before, not to that which you, is you, after. You prefer it that way, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's talking about all those people submitting to one to another. Why, but now why? we're getting down here. To, that's elders and, and the male members of society. Now verse why, 22. Why can't it's be a, both? I mean, why do, we, why do we have to say, well, it belongs up there, but it doesn't belong down here? Why does it belong down here and not up there? It belongs to both. It's the tie, it's the link between the, the, what goes before and what comes after. Well, look at what it says about husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. So this is the definition of husband submission. Yes. Okay. Unto death. He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word and after making it clean by washing it in water in order to present the church to himself in all its beauty, pure and faultless, without spot or wrinkle or any other perfection, imperfection, men ought to love their wives just as they love their own bodies. A man who loves his wife loves himself. I mean, that certainly would be the case with Adam, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Eve was made out of his rib, right? right. People never hate their own bodies. Instead, they feed them and take care of them just as Christ does at church, for we are members of his body, and, and so forth. It goes on down. So why are the instructions to men somewhat different than the instructions to women? Shouldn't it be equal both ways? Well, Paul is just uh, reflecting the norms and attitudes of his culture. He doesn't really understand how things are supposed to be. not. Paul is just telling us about culture. He's not talking about anything inspired here, right? What's so different about, about what is being said there? Well, I mean, l look at it. Let's, <coughs> let's look at it for just a second again. If we, if we, if we look at it in, in the overall spiritual sense that we're, we're after here, mm -hmm. is there much difference? Uh, well, probably not. Yeah. It, but if we look at it in a very temporal, a very uh, egocentric framework, then there's huge differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, <clears throat> um, let's go back and we'll see where we are here. Look at Colossians. Paul wrote Ephesians and Colossians together. There's a shorter version of those instructions found in Colossians. Wives, submit to your husbands, for that is what you should do as Christians. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, it is your Christian duty to obey your parents always, for that is what pleases God. Parents, do not ir irritate your children. They will become discouraged. Why is Paul writing this? Are there problems this way? <laughs> or is he just, you know, well, talking about the way things ought to be? Are there any problems today in this way? Well, with some. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, are, what does it really mean to submit yourselves to one another? It, it, it's the whole framework of selfless versus selfish. Mm -hmm. All of the things, the problems that come up are when we feel that our whatever we're talking about is violated somehow and we will me, me, me. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we love our wives as Christ loved, mm -hmm. that would be a totally selfless, self, unselfish existence. My, what a change that would be. Yeah. And what about, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll support that the interpretation of that part of the text, but what about the other part there now? How does, how does the same application apply to, to uh, uh, Women? wives obeying their husbands? Mm -hmm. well, if it was in that same, se uh, that same self, if the husband was relating to the wife in that selfless way, would the wife have any problem if she was also unselfish dealing with a husband, I think not. How come the guy isn't told to obey? He's told to love as Christ loved. Now, if that isn't tough, 
<laughs> I didn't say tough. <laughs> Hard to do. Obey. Why wasn't? Why isn't he told to obey his wife? And maybe God's holding a higher standard for him. Or after he delineates what the male is supposed to do and the female is supposed to do, why doesn't he say and vice versa? Makes me remember the uh, the quote you brought up about the author William Faulkner. This kind of the exact opposite. We're supposed to lay our lives down. Mm -hmm. William Faulkner wanted to outlast his wife. Mm -hmm. he, he said that and vice versa in verse 21. Mm -hmm. Does he not tell the wife to lay her life down? No. Because she doesn't need to be told that? She would do that naturally anyway? Or does that mean she has an advantage in getting into the kingdom of God? I don't understand that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't we say a selflessness is the key mm -hmm. to being a Christian, right? If you're suggesting that women sort of naturally are more like that, does more, that... More in tune to the Holy Spirit, perhaps? What I'm saying gentle, is... Gentle, loving. What I'm, I guess what I'm saying is God did not tell the woman that, that she should be willing to lay her life down for her spouse because she didn't need to be told that. She's naturally more loving. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that what you were implying? Yeah. And the male is naturally more obeying. <laughs> <laughs> which, which one here? <laughs> Why Go is ahead, the technician laughing back there? <laughs> I'd like to point out for the any audience is laughing. time uh, viewers that are watching, <laughs> watching. We usually have <laughs> yeah. a few ladies here. So yeah. It would sure be a, nice. <laughs> yes, this is kind of a special uh, Very situation. Unusual. I can't Which, remember the last time we had right. only men. Fritz probably knew this topic was coming up, so they decided <laughs> not to be here. <laughs> Maybe we well, should call it an unspecial occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so hard for human beings to develop the kind of ideal marriage that God represents in Scripture? Is it because, let me take your comment, is it because we are so naturally selfish? Absolutely. Well, look at Matthew 5, starting with verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Oh, I've got another question. Okay. So, say that last question like something about selfish. Ask that again. Can you, can you do yeah, that? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, it's, it's in the Are handout. Are we so naturally if you, selfish? If you people at home want to look at our handouts, they're available on our website, theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can get these handouts right there. The question was, do we have such problems with marriage, with more than 50% now in our country ending up in divorce? Is it because of our natural selfishness? And so that's one reason why males and females were created as compatible is because we have this tendency Maybe. to help us, to keep us from becoming. That's why Adam and Eve were, were, were created like they were, to, to, to meld with one another's lives to keep them from becoming selfish. Well, maybe Jim would have some, uh, has, in, in the courts in the, and in the divorce courts, how many of them come there where the problem is one is too uh, unselfish to the other? You never hear that. It's, well, in California, it's irreconcilable, in irreconcilable differences or incurable insanity. Take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, one's a zig, one's, one's a zag. You can't reconcile it, so they says they'll take your money and give you a divorce. So. Well, they, actually, in California, there is no divorce. It's called a dissolution of marriage. They, pro they approach marriage as a partnership, and they just dissolve the partnership. So, in California, back 1850s or thereabouts, it, it, the, the Constitution, no divorce in California. Wow. So, to, if, the, if we had the unselfish relationships, we wouldn't end up in divorce court. That's right. Well, I read you these verses, Matthew 5, 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. 
If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose one of your limbs than for your whole body to go to hell. Anybody want to disagree with that? Well, I'm going to add, I'm going to make it real fun. <laughs> These verses should scare everyone. In our society, so-called sex appeal is used to sell almost everything in every place. Whether it's a laundry soap or a new car, sexually attractive women or men are used to catch our attention. I mean, how often do we put some very unattractive person out there to try to advertise a product? What do you think Jesus would say about that trend? Read the first part of that verse again. <laughs> the first part of the verse? You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Yeah. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. Well, that'd be hard on advertisers, wouldn't it? It would be hard on advertisers. How, how can we take that literally? <clears throat> we wouldn't want to take the Bible too seriously, would we? Well, but how can we take that literally when it says right below that you should chop off your hand or pluck your eye out and we don't take that as a literal instruction? Maybe we should. I knew a fellow that did. <clears throat> well, we've heard about people who have he done cut that. His arm, he cut his hmm. hand off. They call him lefty now. I didn't want to make a joke <laughs> about that. But I, don't I, was, I don't know if it was left or right I end, think that the... I think that the issue is, is that we need Jesus. That's right. Mm -hmm. We need Jesus to save us. We can't do it. Even if you look, if you call your brother Raka, if you're on the freeway driving and someone cuts you off and you have a harsh thought in your heart, you've committed murder. Yeah. We need Jesus. Well, and, and you know, talking about driving down the freeway, I mean, in Southern California, you can't drive down the freeway with seeing, without seeing sexually explicit mm -hmm. oh, um, I don't know how explicit but billboards. anyway billboards billboards and so forth I mean with everything they think they can get away with well Ellen White says and I quote this is councils on health page 621 622 if all who profess to obey the law of God were free from iniquity like all of us here right my soul would be delivered but they are not <clears throat> Even some who profess to keep all the commandments of God are guilty of the sin of adultery. What can I say to arouse their benumbed sensibilities? Moral principle, strictly carried out, becomes the only safeguard of the soul. Does that make you want to quake in your boots? It didn't say that we were guilty of adultery if we saw the picture. Right. with a desire to, po to possess it. Mm -hmm. There's where the problem comes in. Where the problem comes in. Okay. So, how you act upon that is how you not meditate upon it, how you wish, how you, your thought process after the view is what determines the trail. But if the, trail. if the if the impulse is there and you don't act upon it, then pray Jesus to God said, pray to God to take it away. Yeah. The motives as well as At the, the times. Yeah. Well, as sinful human beings, we must struggle between that very high moral standard we we're just talking about, on the one hand, and the way Jesus dealt with the woman caught in adultery on the other. I mean, what would you think of Jesus? traveling around with a woman who had been had seven devils cast out of her and lived much of her life as a prostitute. You'd say, that's fine, no problem with the pastor traveling around with this prostitute, right? Probably more than one. There were a lot of other, there's several other women. Read Luke 8. Maybe I should just go there and let's, let's look at that a second in case you've forgotten what it says there. Um, We'll, we'll go there real quick. Well, there were plenty who took him up on that and said, hey, look what he does, look who he eats with, etc., etc." And I quote, Luke 8, the first three verses, Sometime later Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. That's what he apparently did almost all the time, right? <coughs> the twelve disciples went with him and, and most of us don't read these verses, 
And so did some women who, were, who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court. Now he's running around with other people's wives. And Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. These women not only are running around with Jesus, they're supporting him. Praise the Lord. Amen. And also it's a good, it's a good uh, reference point for all of us in the world to look and see that, of course, Jesus can forgive them. He can forgive us. Not that they're worse, not that we're better, but if, if that's the type of forgiveness that Jesus has, he, to forgive the Rahabs, to, you know, to forgive all these other characters throughout mm -hmm. history, including the Nebuchadnezzars and all these other characters, mm -hmm. he can forgive us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, you know, there are, there are hopefully, there are uh, among the there are viewers we have today. There are some single people who are watching. Um, is singleness a gift from heaven? Why not? In 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 in, in the very in, in, our in, very in a perfect system. world, would we all be? Would we all have a mate? <laughs> well, in some societies, they would think that. I lived in Africa, and they don't even know what to, they know they don't even know what to call a, an adult single woman. Mm -hmm. they, don't even, they don't even a woman has to be the daughter of somebody, the wife of somebody, and if she's really attained her goal, she's the mother of a son. So she has to be a daughter, a wife, or a mother. If she's not, they don't even know, they don't even name for her. Of course, they <coughs> they cover their bases that way by. Having more than one wife. Yeah, if you have to. Mm -hmm. Single, mm -hmm. single folks can uh, get a super blessing by spending more time on the Lord's work, as the Lord says. Once we're married, which I think is a wonderful thing, marriage. Once we're married, though, we we've, we've got to spend our time on our kids and our spouse, and you know. Well, here, here's the question: to put it very bluntly, can we as human beings learn to hate the sin? while we love the sinner? I think the answer is yes, but uncommon. <laughs> uncommon. <laughs> yes, 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 but uh, it's harder to do when they're sinning personally against us. Yes. You know, it's, uh, of course it's still doable, but... We just haven't seen it recently. Yes. Well, throughout the Bible, marriage is, you know, here's another conundrum, if you will. Marriage is used to describe the relationship between God and His covenant people. Unfortunately, that relationship was usually in a bad condition. Um, look at Exodus 34, 50. Why, why is that a good model? Uh, well, I'll tell you. I, I, I've thought a lot about this, and I'm sure probably all of us have. You know, I think one of the main reasons why God gave us marriage, he says, someday you're going to live in heaven if you're faithful to me, and you're going to need to get along with a lot of people who think differently than you do. And you need to start by marrying a wife or a husband that thinks different than you. Well, and you well, need to well, practice I that. we were supposed to have, uh, supposed to find a mate that was compatible. That's right. So now you're saying, no, no, they need to be different. Well, I'm saying... <laughs> How many spouses have you seen that are the same as the other spouse? <laughs> By never definition. The, they never disagree. You know, it doesn't happen like that. So I am absolutely convinced this is, a, this is a Ken Hart, so, you know, you don't have to believe this at all. I didn't read this from Ellen White or from the Bible, but I'm absolutely sound convinced like, that God... Like Paul here. Yeah, I'm <laughs> absolutely convinced that God says, look, I made women different and men different, and see if you can get along. If you can learn to get along, then probably you can survive in heaven. Yeah, and I think it is the, the closeness of that relationship, of the marriage relationship, when, it, when it's proper, mm -hmm. that, 
that is what is represented by Christ marrying the church. He's that dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. it it's, it's everything to him. And like that is everything to him. Our wife should be everything to us. Yeah. At, at the risk of, of having the viewing audience think I'm <coughs> certain ways in which I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> then we need to if you if you have way. these if you have these different if you have these two different people that are different so that they can learn to get along in heaven. Wouldn't it be better, wouldn't that be facilitated if the woman would obey? <laughs> <laughs> Is that why Paul gave? <laughs> or, or my wife this. would say, wouldn't it be better if the husband would learn to obey? And wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a whole lot, wouldn't women be a whole lot more lovable if they would obey? That's now there's the, a lesson like from the well, wife's <laughs> leader's Bible, remember that the yeah. wife's <laughs> duty to the husband's you, duty you go to go back to it's the uh, Matthew's Bible from 1541 or something mm -hmm. like that. He says it's in one of the comments on, on, in, the, in, the, in the notes alongside the text was, and if the wife doesn't obey, it's the husband's duty to beat the the fear of the Lord into her head until she does obey. That's to learn that's, to do her do her duty and do it. I yes. think is how it, uh, yes. that would be the Muslim approach. Yes, I'm trying to figure out this obey stuff in Paul's. Uh, <laughs> well, look at Exodus 34. <laughs> obey do, is, means a willingness to listen, right? Mm -hmm. So, not necessarily doing. Right. It, it means to. But it, where did you? That's what. That's what. <laughs> well, I the word, is that the true definition? <laughs> well, from, 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 from the, the Greek about oh, strange the interpretations <laughs> of. No, that's the definition from the Bible. Well, that makes it a lot easier. It does a willingness to listen listen yes because God recognizes we can't I mean if God said okay here are the Ten Commandments and I expect everyone not only to hear them but to do every detail how many of us would be saved <coughs> none so I would just like to say for the record that my wife and I we obey each other all the time sometimes <laughs> Sounds like the human out. condition. <laughs> Yogi Berra. If we always listened, yeah. we wouldn't really have the arguments. Most That's arguments come from not listening. Mm -hmm. like well, divine providence that the, our normal ladies aren't here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exodus 34. I'm, I, I am going to read these verses. <laughs> Do not make any treaties with the people of the country. Now he's talking. No, Moses is the final instructions of Moses. Oh, no, these aren't the final instructions. He repeats them in, in, in Deuteronomy. But this is his first. God saying to Moses, Do not make any treaties with the people of the country because when they worship their pagan gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you to join them and you will be tempted to eat the food they offer to their gods. Your sons might marry those foreign women who would lead them to be unfaithful to me and to worship their pagan gods. And what happened? That's exactly what happened. Uh, I don't know how many of you, maybe I shouldn't even read this. It might not be appropriate on the on, on Bible, on the, on the television. <laughs> Ezekiel 16. The Lord spoke to me again, mortal man, he said, point out to Jerusalem what disgusting thing she has done. Tell Jerusalem what the sovereign Lord is saying to her. You were born in the land of Canaan, your father was an Amorite, and your mother was a Hittite. I mean, that's about the worst thing you could say to a Jew. When you were born, no one cut your umbilical cord and washed you or rubbed you with salt or wrapped you in a cloth. No one took enough pity on you to do any of these things for you. When you were born, no one loved you. You were thrown out in an open field. Then I, this is God speaking, then I passed by and saw you squirming in your own blood. You were covered with blood, but I wouldn't let you die. I made you grow like a healthy plant. You grew strong and tall and became a young woman. Your breasts were well formed and your hair had grown, but you were naked. As I passed by again, I saw that the time had come for you to fall in love. I covered your naked body with my coat and promised to love you. Yes, I made a marriage covenant with you and you became mine. And it goes on to describe what kind of relationship that turned out to be. I hope that's what wasn't, wasn't what Paul was talking about when, or thinking about when he talked about having a marriage relationship that was like between Christ and the church. I like the verse here, verse 12 of Ezekiel 16. Mm -hmm. I put a ring in your nose. Yes. <laughs> God is uh, doing some unusual things there, isn't he? Yes, he sure is. <laughs> 
Well, in Moses' day, sexual intimacy and the reproductive capacity were worshipped almost as if they were magic. <coughs> The fertility cult religions grew out of those ideas. God recognized what an incredibly evil influence these, re, those religions would, were going to have on his people when they got mixed up in them. The truth of that prophecy in Exodus 34 was seen before the children of Israel got out of the desert. And 24,000 of them died there before they basically had crossed the Jordan River. Well, we know what Ephesians 5 says. Look at Revelation 19, 5 to 9. Then there came from the throne the sound of a voice saying, Praise our God, all his servants and all people, both great and small, who have reverence for him. Then I heard what sounded like a large crowd, like the sound of a roaring waterfall, like loud peals of thunder. I heard them say, Praise God, for the Lord our Almighty God is King. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us praise his greatness, for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself for it. She has been given clean, shining linen to wear. The linen is the good deeds of God's people. Are we looking forward to being the Lamb's bride? Yes. I sure hope so. Well, what do we Seventh-day Adventists need to do to try to avoid the immoral mess which is engulfing our world? How can we make choices and live lives that demonstrate to the world the power of a true Christian life? Once again, we should note the stark contrast between the ideals suggested by the creation story and the very different morality implied by evolution. Think about that for a moment. There's nothing in the evolutionary process to suggest that we should avoid sexual immorality. In fact, animals and birds have a wide variety of mating patterns. I mean, pick your choice. Some types of fish even change sex when necessary. Many animals, birds, and fish are polygamous. Others are very promiscuous. It is, is it any wonder that people who believe we have descended from these creatures feel comfortable in moving around between partners? Evolution gives us no basis for sexual morality. Can you find any basis in Darwinian evolution for practicing morality, moral sexuality? Well, in both the Old and, again, now I'm going to quote Ellen White, this time it's Desire of Ages. In both the Old and New Testament, the marriage relationship is employed to represent the tender and sacred union that exists between Christ and his people. To the mind of Jesus, the gladness of the wedding festivities pointed forward to the rejoicing of that day when he shall bring home his bride to the Father's house, and the redeemed with the Redeemer shall sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Desire of Ages, page 151. And when he has promised to be with us and take care of us and bring us into to that environment, and we just selfishly ignore that and run off and get involved with the things of this earth, that's, that's the unfaithfulness that is described and it's so easy for us to be part of that. Yeah. Well, can you think of any good examples from the Bible of, of happy, good marriage relationships? We've talked about Adam and Eve. Can you think of any others? <coughs> Boaz and Ruth. <coughs> Boaz and Ruth. What about that? Any others? Well, Jacob and Rachel. Well, then there was Leah. I don't know how good that was. I think Abraham and Sarah were. That would be a good I think example. They were, uh, uh, good Even one. though he denied that uh, Sarah was his wife down twice. in Egypt twice. And Sarah yeah. suggested he take Hagar? Yeah. Well, as local Adventists, let's, let's think out of the box for a moment. As local Adventist congregation, should we seek out ways to strengthen marriage ties and raise the standard of morality among our members as an example to the world around us? What would happen if we did that? Have we developed a clear understanding of God's original design for marriage? If human marriage is supposed to be carried out in a pattern following the example of Christ's love and care for the church, what can we learn from, from Philippians 2? You remember in Philippians 2 it says, Christ came down from his high position down to this earth. He died for us. Well, before sin entered our world, Adam and Eve were perfectly happy to live together as equals. After sin entered, a slightly different standard was set up. As you now understand them, 
What is implied by these new standards? No doubt each marriage is develops a little differently from every other marriage. None of us is exactly like any other person, but there are certain principles set forth in Scripture as to how the marriage relationship is supposed to grow. God created us in His image, male and female. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. This means that the male partner, usually exemplifying more strength and decisiveness and assertiveness, is to learn from his wife, who exemplifies more of the caring, softness, concern, and love than more characteristic of the female side. And she is to learn from him. Each partner is to learn from the other until together they grow to be more like God. Remember Genesis 3, 16? What did God mean when he said to Eve, you will still have desire for your husband, yet you will be subject to him? Ellen White describes that verse, Had the principles enjoined in the law of God been cherished by the fallen race, this sentence, though growing out of the results of sin, would have proved a blessing to them. But man's abuse of the supremacy thus given him was too, has too often rendered the lot of women very bitter and made her life a burden. Adventist Home, page 115. Husbands, do you love your wife with self-emptying, self-sacrificial love? Have you learned to love her as Christ loved the church? Wives, have you learned how to relate to your husband in a submissive but loving way to soften and, and nurture his love for you? Are both husbands and wives following this incredibly important divine direction so that we can enjoy the kind of marriages God designed we should experience? Do you think it's possible that this is God's plan for helping us to prepare ourselves for living in heaven? I know it was a Ken Hart, but it sure seems right to me. We don't even know what kind of creatures we'll be living with in heaven. We know a little bit about the angels. We know a little bit about God. What about the other creatures that live in all other parts of the universe? If we have trouble living with our husband or our wife, what if we're next door to someone that is a one-eyed green monster or something? We don't know. Aren't we supposed to learn to how to live with people who maybe think a little different than we do? People who someday will say, what was wrong with you people when you decided to follow Satan? No? Anyway, it leaves you something to think about. We'll see you next week.